From the beginning, stereotypes against stepmothers have always existed. Stories and movies have normalized describing stepmothers as evil parents. On the other hand, stepfathers have never had to deal with that much heat. What horror movie focuses on an evil stepdad? Well, after finding out the horrifying atrocities that Gregory Graff committed, you'll soon learn that stepfathers can be evil too. And not just in movies. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we will be looking at the case of Jessica Paget. Let's get into it, shall we? Jessica was born to Thomas Katzmar and Danielle Bootner on December 15, 1980, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in the United States. Sadly, Jessica did not stay with her biological father for too long, as her mother remarried when she was only 12 years old. Jessica's mother, Danielle, tied the knot a second time with a man named Gregory Graff, who then naturally became Jessica's stepfather. According to Jessica, Gregory was just like a father to her. He cared for her and paid attention to her exactly how any father would to their biological child. For most of her childhood, Jessica's mother, stepfather, and four siblings all lived together in their family home. Both parents also ran a joint business that involved planting and replacing fences in people's homes. And with the money they earned from their business, they were able to take great care of their children. In 1998, Jessica graduated from Whitehall High School and then went on to study early childhood education at Lehigh Carbon Community College. Later on, she met Michael Paget, and the two hit off a romantic relationship. The pair were together for eight years before they decided to get married in August 2014. In the eight years prior to their marriage that they had been together, the couple had already had three sons together. Just like her own mother, Jessica took great care of her children. And on several occasions, she showed that she was very committed to ensuring that they had a proper childhood. Jessica did not only have the well-being of her children in mind, but that of other children as well. She worked in a daycare and was said at some point to have confessed that she loved her job. For the longest time, Jessica's life went on smoothly and she spent her days enjoying the company of her husband and children. However, one fateful November night, things took a turn for the worst. On November 14th, 2014, Jessica's husband, Michael Paget, left for work in a co-worker's car as he usually did. Jessica was then left in the house with her three children. Since it was a school day, the dedicated mother knew that she had to get all three of her children ready for school and herself ready for work. In record time, Jessica got her children ready and drove all but one of them to school. The youngest of her three children had not started school at the time. So, she drove both of them in her white Subaru Outback station wagon to the daycare where she worked. Jessica got to work at 8.30 a.m., but left about four hours later at 12.50, after telling co-workers that she had to leave so that she could run an errand for her stepfather. According to her, her stepfather had called her and said that he needed help with his fax machine. Thinking nothing of it, Jessica left to see her stepfather like any dutiful daughter would, telling her co-workers that she would be back in the next 30 minutes. As she stepped out, she left her youngest child in the daycare since she thought she would be returning anyway. Jessica, however, never returned to the daycare. After several hours of radio silence, Jessica had still not returned. Naturally, her co-workers grew very worried, especially since they knew that she would never leave her child in the daycare. It wasn't something she would do. Determined to find out what was going on, Jessica's co-workers began to call her phone, but they got no response. They continued calling for about two hours until they figured that it would be best to call Michael, her husband. Fortunately, her co-workers were able to reach Michael, but Michael had no idea where Jessica was either. The news got to Michael that his wife hadn't returned to work since she left to run an errand. Michael immediately put a call across to Jessica's mom, Danielle, who was in Florida at the time. Because Danielle wasn't in the state at the time, she suggested that Michael call Jessica's stepfather, Gregory, instead. Michael did, and still nothing changed. Gregory told Michael that he hadn't seen Jessica the whole day, and like any mother would do when they find out that their child is nowhere to be found, 
Danielle cut her Florida trip short and went back home immediately. At this point, Michael and Jessica's friends began to speculate that Jessica was probably missing. After going round and round and putting calls across here and there for four hours, they all decided to head to the police. Afterward, the police declared Jessica missing and began to investigate her case almost immediately. The police put out an all points bulletin, which is an alert sent out to law enforcement officers to indicate that somebody, probably a suspect, or something like a vehicle is being searched for in connection to a crime. In Jessica's case, the APB was put in search of her car because she had left the daycare in it. Notwithstanding, the police also carried out regular checks by visiting hospitals and morgues in the area to see if Jessica had maybe gotten into an accident and had to be admitted or worse. As it turned out, the police in the area weren't properly equipped for this kind of case. So, they decided to call in the Pennsylvania State Police. After the arrival of the State Police, proper investigations commenced. Friends and family of Jessica were called in for questioning, and the police also checked the surveillance cameras in the area. Eventually, the authorities sent a signal to Jessica's phone and were fortunate enough to get a location update. As a result, they were able to locate Jessica's car which was sitting abandoned in the General Dollar parking lot that was in the area. The police proceeded to check the vehicle and discovered that while it was unlocked, Jessica was not in it. What they did find in the car, however, were her keys and credit cards. This raised an even greater concern for the family members. As is customary, the police went around the parking lot to check the surveillance cameras in the area. In the process, they saw that someone had driven the white Subaru Outback station wagon into the parking lot, had gotten out of the vehicle, and had walked down the alley. Someone they thought was Jessica because the capture on the surveillance wasn't quite clear. Following this discovery, the police declared a public search for Jessica, and it went on for about five days. During this period, the family constantly released hand flyers with pictures of Jessica on them. The news also spread online, and people began sharing them on social media. As a matter of fact, local and national TV stations also carried the report of Jessica's disappearance. While all of these were going on, the police kept bringing in Jessica's stepfather for questioning because it was said that he kept giving contradicting statements. The first time he was brought in for questioning, he said he didn't see Jessica at all that day. Meanwhile, before Jessica left the daycare, she told her co-workers that she was going to run an errand for her stepfather. In a later statement, Gregory said that Jessica had not come to fix his fax machine, and that his fax machine had been broken for a long time, and that he wasn't home the day Jessica claimed to have called her to come to fix the fax machine. According to him, he was out getting lunch at the time because Danielle wasn't in the home. Apparently, he had gone to the gas station to get lunch. However, when police looked over the video footage at the gas station, they saw that Gregory didn't show up at the time. It then dawned on the police that since Gregory had lied about coming out to get lunch, he probably was indoors instead. Armed with this new information, the police decided to look through the video footage that last caught Jessica's car. Since it wasn't very clear the first time, they sharpened the images this time, and after doing so, they discovered that it was most likely a man who had come out of Jessica's car. Their reason for this speculation was that whoever came out of the car was significantly taller than the car. Still, from the footage, they also found out that when the person got out of the car, they stooped down to make themselves smaller and then pushed the driver's seat closer to the steering wheel, probably to make it look as though a petite person just got out of the car. Now, aware that something fishy was going on, the police kept watching the video footage, and this time, they found something more interesting. The footage showed someone walking into the alleyway, and just a few minutes later, they saw a man leaving the alleyway in a truck that was said to have had obvious racing stripes beneath it. After necessary investigation, it was confirmed that the truck in question belonged to Jessica's stepfather, Gregory Graff. Immediately, the police requested a search warrant and also got permission from Danielle to search hers and Gregory's home. In the course of the search, the police found small amounts of blood on a tissue in the basement of their home. They also found the fax machine, 
which Gregory allegedly claimed had been broken. Interestingly, they found out that the fax machine was in good working condition. This discovery also countered Gregory's statement, where he said the fax machine had ceased working, long before Jessica claimed that he had called her to come fix it. The police also found out that the fax machine had actually been used around 1.04 p.m. on November 21st. They were able to figure this out because they found a paper in the fax machine with Jessica's signature on it with the time and date as 1.04 p.m. and November 21st. At this point, the police decided to press a lot harder on Gregory, and lucky for them, Gregory cracked. He kept telling the police that he would not be able to see his dogs anymore. So the police figured that he was going to confess. And as they rightly suspected it, he did. Gregory confessed to the police that he killed his stepdaughter, Jessica, in his house. According to him, Jessica did not see it coming because he made sure she did not suspect anything. He said that when Jessica went into his house, she went straight away to the fax machine while he went into his room to take out his handgun. As she bent over, trying to fix the machine, he raised the gun and shot her in the back of the head. When asked why he did such a vile thing to a woman that had taken him as her father, Gregory said that his motive was sexual. According to him, he had a crazy feeling, and it was something sexual in nature. He said that while Jessica was in the house, his mind was spinning, and that he kept thinking about sex. And so, he shot her and violated her body for two hours, all the while cursing at her. He also confessed that he had gotten sex toys some days before he killed Jessica, and he figured that that was the right moment to use them. So not only did Gregory violate his stepdaughter's corpse, but he also confessed to using the sex toys he had gotten on her. To make matters worse, Gregory also confessed to recording himself while he sexually abused his stepdaughter's corpse. He told the police that after he had tampered with his stepdaughter's corpse, he went ahead to bury her body in the house where he lived with her mother. The house was on 451 Covered Bridge Road in Allentown. Also, Gregory had apparently made an illustration on paper to help the police find Jessica's body. And on November 26, 2014, the police found Jessica's body covered in a blanket with dirt all over her. Gregory confessed to killing Jessica five days after she was declared missing. And because the police already had solid evidence that Gregory committed the crime, he was eventually arrested. Gregory was charged with first degree murder. Seeing how involved the Pennsylvania State Police had been in Jessica's case, they decided to write a statement showing their appreciation and also pleaded with the public to give the family a bit of privacy. Despite the efforts of the police, the family was once again faced with the gruesome acts Gregory carried out on Jessica during Gregory's trial in court. During the proceedings, the prosecution had to reveal the video Gregory himself recorded while he was sexually assaulting his stepdaughter's corpse. As expected, several people asked to be excused from the court that day. And the only sounds that could be heard in the room were sniffs from people crying. Seeing as the case had evolved to this point, Gregory's defense attorney had nothing else to say other than try to make the jury believe that Gregory had not premeditated his stepdaughter's murder and that something had probably triggered him to kill her and do all that he did with her. On November 13th, 2015, Gregory was found guilty of first degree murder and was also found guilty of taking sexual advantage of her corpse. He was sentenced to life in prison with zero chance of parole. Gregory is currently serving his sentence in Fayette County, southwestern Pennsylvania. While some believe that Gregory got what was coming to him when he received his life sentence, others are of the opinion that he deserved to face the death penalty for what he did. What both parties can agree on, however, is that justice was served, at least to a large extent. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Jessica Paget. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.